Good afternoon, uh, good morning, good evening, everyone. We are about to start uh, this webinar uh, on cholera, on current cholera outbreak. Um, so before I officially present my colleagues who will be the speakers for today's webinar, we will just wait one more minute for the people to enter into the room. I invite you all uh, to write your name, your affiliation, and the country that you are connected from in the chat, please. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Uh, and again, uh, good afternoon from Geneva, good morning uh, uh, to the part of the world that is waking up at the moment, but also good evening to our colleagues in Asia and Western Pacific, if anyone is connected, and we hope so. Um, from a good, good day to everyone from other regions. Um, and we are happy that you are joining us for this webinar on uh, cholera situation and current outbreaks that are going on um, uh, in the world. So I would like to present uh, that today we would have, uh, well, Dr. Sylvie Briand will not be uh, physically with us, uh, neither online because she is on a different meeting, but we will start this webinar with her opening remarks. Um, then I do have um, uh, great speakers for today, Dr. Philip Barbosa, who is the team lead uh, for cholera and epidemic diarrheal di diseases uh, here from the HQ, uh, WHO HQ. And we also have Dr. Otim Patrick Ramdan from Health Emergency Officer, but he's Incident Manager for Afro WHO. Uh, I uh, don't know if the, uh, Mr. Henry Gray, our current incident manager for Cholera is online, but if not, uh, we will be really well represented um, as well here. So without uh, further ado, uh, I would uh, ask my colleagues here if we can play the video from Dr. Sylvie Briand. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. I'm Dr. Sylvie Briand. I'm the director of the Epidemic and Pandemic Preparedness and Prevention Department at WHO. It's my great pleasure today to welcome you to this Wednesday WHO webinar on cholera. It's part of the EpiWIN series to translate science and knowledge. And we have invited today experts on cholera to tell you about the current situation of this disease. In fact, we have many outbreaks of cholera currently around the world, and this is a very sad situation that could be uh, prevented. And that's why we think it's important to talk about this disease. Cholera is not a new disease, it's an old disease. We have, we have had it for centuries. And uh, in fact, it became a pandemic disease with steamboat and trains because with fast means of transportation, it was possible for someone infected to um, move to another place and then fell sick in another place and transmit the disease somewhere else. So um, it's a pandemic disease as well, uh, but it has been eliminated in many countries in the world because uh, people have access to safe water and sanitation and uh, that's why it's so important to talk about it. Also, I would like to uh, highlight that before 2005, before we revised the international health regulation, cholera was one of the three mandatory notifiable diseases internationally, together with plague and yellow fever. So it's an important uh, disease, but now we see it only uh, in places where uh, people live in a very uh, difficult condition, such as refugee camp, or in developing countries where people don't have access to safe water and sanitation. 
So I'm very happy that we have today this webinar to talk about it uh, because I've been in the field many times to uh, respond to cholera outbreak and I can tell you it's, it's, a, it's a devastating epidemic. Um, families can be decimated by it and, and it's really horrible because uh, you wake up in the morning, you are completely healthy and in a matter of few hours you can be so dehydrated that you die immediately. And even sometimes you see people dying while they try to uh, reach the healthcare center. And so you see bodies lying on the street and it's, it's, really, um, um, it's really a terrible uh, situation. So I hope that by having those conversations, those webinars, we can raise awareness about cholera and also, about, uh, and, and also raise hope uh, that we can also overcome this kind of disease in the future if we invest sufficiently in safe water and sanitation in those countries. So with this, I wish you a very nice uh, meeting and I hope that our expert will answer your question. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Well, I would like to say thank you to Dr. Sylvie Briand directly, uh, but uh, again, we hope to have her on um, our next EPIWIN webinar. And um, I said uh, together with me here in the room is Dr. Philip Barbosa. Um, and uh, well, he will uh, give the first presentation of uh, this webinar. So let me help. We are having a little bit of, yeah. Uh, sh let me stop sharing the screen just a second. Okay. We are coming with the presentation. Uh, let me just. I hope you can all uh, see uh, it's online. Dr. <laughs> Barbosa, over to you. Okay, so good day to everyone. So to be shorter like that. So, uh, so, uh, so I am Philippe Barboda. So I am the team lead of the cholera program as well as the head of the secretariat of the global task force on uh, cholera control. Um, so next, please. So before, uh, you know, getting on the, uh, uh, the, the hot topic, I think it's important to give an overview of what uh, the, the Global Task Force on Cholera Control is. Uh, it's an international partnership with over 50 institutions, including uh, United Nations, uh, NGO, academic, ministries of health, etc., etc. Okay, so it's a very large uh, consortium uh, uh, of um, and an international partner partnership, and the Secretariat is hosted at W. There is also an operational arm uh, called the Country Support Platform, which is hosted at uh, the International Federation of the Red Cross and Red Crescent. So the initial uh, objective of uh, the, uh, the Global Cholera Task Force uh, was uh, defined in the roadmap that was uh, elaborated in 2017 um, and was to support the country that at that time were still listed as pandemic. There was 47 countries and as you will see, and uh, that has need to be changed, it's actually three additional country would have to be added to the list just for uh, uh, the end of last year and the beginning of this year. So as mentioned, but you will have access to that, uh, there is an indoor strategy which really define what needs to be done in terms of cholera control. Um, and it's called the ending cholera, a global roadmap to uh, 2030. Next, please. So the objective of the roadmap huh, are quite clear. It's really to reduce the cholera deaths by 90%. And this is the first uh, of the objective. And uh, for me, it's one of the most important. Uh, it's to eliminate, eliminate transmission uh, in 20 countries. Uh, so as you have seen, huh, there are 47 plus now 350 countries that are still listed as pandemic, but at least to have eliminated transmission 
<coughs> in 20 countries by 2030 and to uh, have no more uncontrolled outbreak occurring in any part of the world. So this is a country-driven approach uh, around uh, 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 three axes. The first one being uh, you know, early detection and immediate response to outbreak. Uh, the second one is multi-sectorial preventive intervention in cholera hotspot, and this is something which is important. It's not a national strategy, but really to try to focus on the area that are systematically affected by cholera, so much more uh, uh, tailored. And of course, uh, you know, that's through a partnership and coordination uh, to enhance and uh, optimize the country support mechanism. So for that, there are five technical pillars plus the coordination, and this is extremely important. So it's, of course, water, uh, sanitation and hygiene. It's uh, uh, surveillance, uh, including both the epidemiological and the laboratory surveillance. Uh, the oral cholera vaccine, the uh, increased accessibility to healthcare system, and the one which is very often forgotten, but which is extremely important, is community engagement. Next, please. So, as uh, mentioned before, I mean, I think uh, uh, it's quite clear. We know what needs to be done in terms of cholera control. The problem is more how to implement that. So, all the different pillars have their own uh, strengths and weaknesses. So, uh, cholera vaccine, I mean, this is uh, uh, something which is in high demand. It's an effective, cheap, and easy to administer. It's an oral vaccine. Uh, it's used both for outbreak response, but also for preventive vaccination campaign. However, there are some challenges. The uh, production is extremely limited, uh, and the demand far exceeds uh, the, the need. The two doses, uh, when administrated, they, pro they provide only a limited immunity, estimated to at least three years. Uh, and although it's a very efficient tool, it's not a long-term solution, and that must be reminded. We are not going to control cholera with vaccination. Uh, surveillance, including both the epidemiology uh, and lab, this is uh, really one of the cornerstones of the strategy. It's really to determine where uh, uh, the area uh, of intervention. Unfortunately, so far, it's still based too much on uh, clinical uh, uh, <coughs> uh, description of cases with uh, suboptimal uh, laboratory confirmation and reporting in many instances. So, uh, the, uh, I will keep the, the, the most important for the end, healthcare strengthening. This is something which is uh, extremely important and will be becoming increasingly important. We will see that uh, the increasing mortality is of a major concern. But again, we have for cholera, it's no death could occur with cholera. We have all the tools to prevent cholera death. It's easy, it's simple, it's cheap. The problem is that people don't have access uh, in a timely manner uh, to this very basic treatment, okay? And cholera can kill within hours, so this timeliness of access is uh, absolutely critical, including simple uh, oral radiation salt that could make a big difference. <clears throat> and that's why also the community-based uh, case management and treatment is something that needs to be further developed. Uh, Community engagement uh, is, of course, essential. We have to stop, uh, you know, uh, defining what is important for the people. They have to define what is feasible, practical, and uh, available for them. And of course, the most and most important uh, is access to water and sanitation and basic water and sanitation. This is a long-term solution. Many of the northern countries have controlled cholera just only on improving water and sanitation. Unfortunately, this is something which still uh, required much more uh, political engagement and support. Next, please. So in terms of background, so uh, official data uh, that are reported are, are undermining the, uh, the, 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 there is a gross under reporting. Uh, but uh, what is clear with cholera, it's a very clear marker of both uh, inequality and poverty. Um, uh, the, the number of deaths that uh, of cases and deaths that are reported on average, uh, it's about uh, uh, over 100,000 cases and less than, uh, than 300 deaths per year. While some estimation uh, done on modeling uh, estimate that there is at least on average and normal years over 3 million cases and about 100,000 deaths alone. 
So uh, despite their limit, uh, what we have seen in uh, previous year up to 2021 was a global trend in reduction of both mortality and morbidity. Well, with one exception in Yemen, but that we are not going to comment on that. But uh, there was really, and this was done on uh, with the effort of country to uh, control cholera. Next, please. So 2021, so why 2021? Because this is the last year of consolidated data. So the, the, the consolidated data for 2022 will be available in the coming months. But already you can see that there was a very sharp increase in case fatality rate, uh, <clears throat> mainly uh, uh, in Africa where there are a little bit more reliable data. But you can see that uh, after years of reduction in 2021 in Africa, the case fatality rate was almost 3%. I'd like to remind that the threshold, the acceptable threshold, and which is already very high, is 1%. So it's really much uh, uh, higher than expected. Next, please. So. Again, huh, we have uh, explained that uh, you know the, the the intrinsic factor that are fueling cholera are very simple. It's uh, access to safe water. Um, to in too many places there is open defecation just because people do not have another alternative. Uh, accessibility to healthcare because of conflict or simply because they are too far away. And again, poverty and vulnerability. So this is uh, uh, amplified by a number next uh, of uh, uh, external driving factors that are uh, conflict, humanitarian crisis, national disasters, hunger, trade, uh, and other population movements. But um, the situation we are facing this year uh, and last year uh, were fueled by first COVID, next. Uh, and uh, which has a very negative impact, uh, especially on resource-limited country in driving out, uh, you know, resources and um, and stuff. But also, what we are seeing more and more and more, and very visibly in 2022 and 2023, the effect of climate change. We see again, it's not the cause, but this is a major amplifying factor. Next, please. So. Um, so that the, uh, the, the, the the overview from 2022 to 2023, um, uh, so there were at least uh, 21 countries that reported uh, outbreak. Uh, with 20 countries directly at risk. Uh, that put at least uh, 1 billion people directly uh, uh, at risk of cholera and with a very high CFR. I mean, as you can see, uh, apart from uh, Haiti and the uh, Dominican Republic, but you know, most of the WHO region are affected and uh, uh, we have not seen such a large number of outbreak in many years. Next, please. So, um, uh, as of today, so I mean, of course, we have to prioritize a number of uh, our uh, support to countries. So we have uh, classified, but this is reviewed uh, on a weekly basis almost. Uh, nine very acute countries uh, where the uh, uh, outbreak are really uh, of extreme concern, but also 17 countries where there is a, still an active outbreak, and at least. 17 countries that are direct risk, and by direct risk, I mean sharing the uh, national border with uh, one of the other country. So, in fact, the number of cases uh, of countries that could be at risk is much bigger because, you know, uh, uh, cholera is traveling with people. So, um, this also, in looking at this data, you need to bear in mind that this is uh, uh, because of the different seasonality in different parts of the world, usually the lowest transmission period, as in many areas of the world, including in West Africa or in Asia, the peak will come with the rain or the moussan, so uh, later uh, uh, during the course of the year. So, uh, so it does not mean that it's a reduction in the number of cases, just that we are in normally in a more, normally more quiet period, which is not the case. Next. So <clears throat> I just want to, to make a little bit uh, of a step back and just to, uh, uh, you know, uh, to, to, to show you what happened in the year between uh, the end of 99 uh, and uh, the beginning of 2021. Uh, again, because in this part of the world, the transmission is uh, uh, over two calendar years. But at the same time, 
with the same kind of situation, uh, meaning a very strong La Nina uh, cl uh, climatic phenomenon. There was a massive outbreak that started from Djibouti up to South Africa. Okay, with extremely high uh, number of cases reported, including over a thousand, uh, hundred thousand cases for South Africa alone in Sengelier, more than 20,000 cases in Madagascar. And that's based on cases that were officially reported. We are exactly in the same climatic uh, and contextual situation in the eastern part of Africa. Next, please. So, um, of course, I mean, we don't have the time today to go in detail for through all the 20 uh, countries. So, I mean, we have to regroup it. But, you know, the Austral and Southern Africa is the most affected area, very clearly, uh, with many countries uh, have been, been affected by very severe cyclone at the beginning of 2022 and uh, with very every rain throughout the year. I'm sure you all know that uh, uh, Cyclone Freddy had hit the area twice already, the same cyclone. Um, so when people are challenging the impact of climate change, it's extremely rare to have a cyclone coming back at the same place uh, twice in a row. So it uh, it it uh, over the weekend uh, again, Mozambique and Malawi that that are already very badly affected by a cholera outbreak. Um, the Horn of and East of Africa is affected by very severe drought that is pushing a lot of people in search of water, pasture, etc., to uh, different places and therefore moving with cholera as well. So, uh, so this is also uh, the drought is also a very uh, clear indicator of the climate change. Uh, in the Europe and Middle East, uh, uh, the situation now is uh, not as conducive because of the winter, uh, which is not a good uh, uh, element for for uh, for transmission. But that does not mean that the risk is not existing. And more importantly, the risk will increase with the temperature raising, and it's very likely that we could see some resurgence in uh, um, cholera outbreak in this area. Um, uh, Central uh, and uh, East Asia, uh, again, low period of transmission. You, the peak are usually just before the Muson or just after the Muson, so more uh, later in the year. Uh, and uh, Hispaniola, which is probably the only one that is not really, uh, so Hispaniola being uh, Haiti and the Dominican Republic, and so it's the island um, where the, the main driver is conflict, humanitarian crisis, though we are also on the uh, cyclone season. Uh, but at least this is maybe the only exception where the, the climate change has not so far played a major role. Next, please. So the... the uh, the, the situation, as I try to highlight, is really concerning. And uh, uh, But the, the point I really want to, to emphasize is that cholera can be strengthened. So, yes, um, CFR is far too high, case fatality rate. Uh, we are in most of the country where we have cases, uh, not all, but most of the country, far above the 1% uh, acceptable threshold. Um, I want to uh, uh, remind that all cholera deaths should be uh, prevented. We have the tool for that. Um, uh, and the, the, what matters is really the timeliness for accessibility to this treatment. So it's also very important to reinforce surveillance, uh, which is one of the weak points in many of the affected area because of lack of resources. But having a good surveillance would be the best way also to optimize the utilization of the resources. So. Uh, we are facing a big challenge in um, uh, cholera commodity, uh, meaning uh, vaccine, drugs, etc., etc., because of the increased demand. So this is a, a, also something which is very uh, challenging, and that the multiplication of outbreak also uh, have a strong impact on the capacity of partners to respond to multiple outbreak. Because there is not only cholera, there are also humanitarian crises, other infectious diseases. So. The message that we are trying to convey, and we expect that you will try to convey at your level as well, it's urgent to in, in, invest in wash, in wash, in wash. Now, this is a long-term solution. So uh, responding to outbreaks, that's one thing, but uh, it's a plaster on a wooden leg. What we should be able to do is to prevent the occurrence, and that can be done sustainably only through better access to basic safe water and basic sanitation, uh, while, of course, not forgetting uh, the, uh, the the strengthening of surveillance case management and the engagement of the community in uh, uh, sustainable control. N next. 
And, and that's the end. Voilà. Over to you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Barbosa, for ah, this. No. Ah, oh, okay. sorry. No, no, I knew that there was something else. <laughs> yeah, okay. So the the um, the thing that uh, so here uh, uh, and you will have the link to that there are a lot of documents there are a lot of resources that are available on the global task force on cholera control uh, who is a part and, uh, and and one of the main main actor of the gtfcc uh, as well so the, the it means that this uh, guidance are also endorsed by uh, by the who cholera program so you have the outbreak response manual that provides a lot of information you have have a cholera app, a cholera application that has been developed that has proved to be very useful, where you can have a lot of information uh, in terms of, you know, uh, treatment, ORS, setting up of a CTC, and this, once uh, downloaded on your phone, it does not need to uh, have access to internet. It does not take too much space. It's available in multiple languages, uh, of course, in French and English, but also in a few other languages. And we are working in translation in other languages. So this is a very useful uh, tool to have on your phone. And uh, most of the, uh, almost all of the documents that are uh, developed are available on uh, both English and French at this point of time. So, uh, voilà. So go to the website. Next, please. So uh, there, there are a lot of, I mean, these are just a, a few examples. You have some uh, um, job aids for, uh, this is the example for, for culture, but there are some others. Uh, lot, I, I just make a few screenshots huh, uh, of the type of document you can find, but, and they are sorted out or classified by different type of intervention, uh, type of document. And there is also a WHO uh, online course uh, that can be taken also in many different languages, French, English, Spanish, Portuguese, and a few others uh, for the people who are interested. And that's really the last one. <laughs> Thank you. Uh... Uh, thank you, Dr. Barbosa. Thank you uh, for this uh, comprehensive presentation of the uh, an overview of the current situation. So um, uh, with that, uh, I would like to give the floor to our colleague from Afro, WHO Afro, Dr. Uh, Otim Patrick, uh, to pre uh, present us the deep dive on cholera and what's going on currently in the WHO Afro region. So over to you, Dr. Patrick, and thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, thanks to Philippe for uh, setting the ground uh, for, for this presentation. So he has covered a number of issues that will make my life uh, quite easy to go through this presentation. Um, so, I will provide just an overview of the situation in the WHO Africa region. And um, as Philippe had mentioned, uh, there are a number of factors that, uh, that drive cholera outbreaks. For us within the region, uh, we have seen that in between January and February, and just end of February, the new cases that are reported really um, have increased by up to 40% of what the total case load that was seen in 2022. So that's one of the biggest concerns that we have, that we have not yet even reached the middle of the year. And the other um, uh, regions, like uh, Philip was mentioning, the rainy season in the West African uh, region, sub-region has not yet come, and also we may have transmission amplified in those regions. So it's concerned that by the end of this year, I think uh, the number of cases will be significant. <clears throat> Um, well, as mentioned in our region, the, the, the cholera outbreak is happening in several contexts. We have natural disasters. Um, as, as Philippe had mentioned, the cyclone, we are really, really uh, uh, trying currently to understand the extent and impact of uh, Freddy 2, Cyclone Freddy, which um, came, had impact in, in, in Madagascar, Mozambique, uh, the first time, um, <clears throat> and then came back again in the last one week and has really had a devastating impact in Mozambique and, and Malawi. And um, this is really causing a lot of flooding. So we have seen outbreaks happening in the context of this cyclone, the flooding in Nigeria and Mozambique and Malawi. And then the extreme end of, of, of those climatic uh, events is also the drought as mentioned in the greater horn of Africa, Kenya, Ethiopia, and, and Somalia. So, 
So those are some of the context. We also have conflict. So we have a number of outbreaks in areas where there's conflict, which results in impaired access to the basic amenities. So some parts of Cameroon, uh, some parts of Northeastern Nigeria, uh, DRC in, in, in the North Kivu area, in South Sudan, also in Somalia and Ethiopia. So um, th these are some of the factors driving uh, the transmission within our region. But we'll also notice then that uh, these outbreaks are occurring in the context of other public health emergencies. We still have the MPOX, we have countries are responding to the wild and, and vaccine derived polioviruses. We have the measles, we have the COVID pandemic and its uh, economic impact uh, that has really constrained the capacities of the governments to be able to effectively respond as well. We also have limited resources. We have, as Philip mentioned, shortage of some of the medical countermeasures for cholera because of the, the number of countries that are responding, particularly the cholera kits and the oral cholera vaccine. But the main uh, fundamental issue, of course, is the poor sanitation um, in, in a number of the areas. And we have seen a lot of transmission within our region linked to the cross-border movement. So as I will explain uh, next, you will see uh, a lot of uh, transmission between Malawi, Mozambique, uh, also up to Tanzania because of the cross-border movements as well. So as, as we see, um, cholera has been, have, uh, has, has been endemic in a number of countries within our region, as Philip had mentioned. And we have been having, uh, prior to 2017, a number of outbreaks, 2017 being the year where we had the highest number of countries having outbreak up to 27 countries. And then um, countries started implementing uh, some of the interventions in the global roadmap in our region in 2018, the ministers of health approved a regional strategy for the implementation of that global roadmap. So we started seeing some improvements and uh, there were increased uh, number of uh, the OCV doses available that were preemptively deployed in a number of the hotspot locations. So it helped to bring the number of outbreaks down. But um, uh, what we are seeing this year, even if we have few countries, Within those few countries, we have regions that do not uh, routinely have outbreaks, reporting outbreaks, and the number of cases being high. So as we speak now, we have 13 countries within the region that have uh, act, uh, active transmission, which is still less than what was there last year. But like as I mentioned, the number of cases is already increasing um, so high. So these are the 13 countries where we have um, uh, active transmission. And you can see uh, cumulatively, that we have over 134,000 cases with 3,000 deaths, giving us a CFR of 2.3. Um, that is cumulative from 2020, from January 2022 up to now. If we look at only 2023, we are already seeing uh, 40,000 um, uh, cases that um, um, that have been reported. So really pointing to that worry we have that uh, by the end of maybe the second quarter of this year and start of third quarter we'll have very high number of cases if uh, we don't respond comprehensively uh, to, 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 to stop the further spread. So we see that pro the highest proportion of cases this year have been from Malawi and Malawi is really experiencing the worst outbreak it has had in decades and then followed by Mozambique and DRC. The fourth one there would be, uh, would be Nigeria. But um, we are worried with the situation in Mozambique and the current rainfalls that have, uh, that have been caused by the cyclone um, that the number of cases will continue to rise. This, the good news is that over the last um, four weeks from week six, we have seen sustained decline in the overall number of cases reported. So it looks like um, the peak was really in, in, in week five um, and we have seen decline for week six. However, um, as, as I mentioned, the progress that we have made for instance, because the biggest driver of our tra uh, transmission, the number of cases was Malawi and the progress we've made in Malawi in the last four weeks to bring down the transmission. Now we have severe devastation caused by the cyclone in the Southern part of the region, which is the same region which was affected in 2022 with the, with the tropical storm Anna and over 10 districts have been affected and the government has declared a state of emergency in those 10. So they, 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 it can quickly reverse the gains that we have made. 
So we've seen a, a in, decrease in cases as well as decrease in deaths. The same, this just focuses on 2023. Um, now, if we see the top countries that have uh, in our region in the last uh, few weeks in terms of transmission, Kenya has been one of those uh, with the initial transmission reported in um, um, 17 counties, but now active in only eight counties out of the 47 counties. So we see this decline in cases. Uh, Malawi, as mentioned, has since sustained decline in the number of cases and deaths, which is a very good. The worry is the Mozambique, which is continuing to see increase in number of cases because of all the issues that we have mentioned before. So now we have um, transmission in 38 districts from seven provinces, which is really a, a big concern there. So just then looking overall, we'll see that if you compare in the last two weeks, there have been a few countries uh, where there have been significant increase in the number of cases. Uh, Burundi was going down, but we see an increase from week nine to week 10. Uh, we see the same in, the, in, in, in Mozambique, as I mentioned. Tanzania has had repeated uh, importations, both from the outbreak in, Malawi, in, in Mozambique and Malawi, but also from the DRC as well. So they keep getting um, uh, importations and they are managing this. The outbreaks remain relatively small. Mozambique has, uh, Zambia has been responding uh, effectively and we see a significant decline in the number of cases in the last one week. We hope it can remain the same. The case fatality ratio, as Philippe had mentioned, we have really been trying to bring this down. At the beginning of the year, it was very, very high at 3%. It has relatively reduced, but still we have countries where uh, the CFR remains high. The biggest uh, contributor to our CFR has been Malawi. But we saw that in the last one week, uh, the other week, week nine, it was 58 deaths, and we saw 10 in the uh, 30 in the last one week. We hope things could stay there, but um, the current events on the ground could really reverse the gains that have been made. So um, a number of response measures are ongoing along the pillar that Philippe mentioned. I did not want to go in details in, in them, but I think the issue of multi-sectoral coordination and collaboration is a priority. Um, clearly emphasizing that the, the, the solution to control cholera is the really provision of water and, uh, and hygiene facilities. Uh, so the issue of wash is very, very important, much as we address some of the health consequences, but really investing in wash, as Philippe mentioned, is critical. So trying to work with the different partners uh, and, and ministries to address this is, is, a, is a big, big priority for us. There was a high level ministerial meeting uh, in uh, Malawi and brought together the uh, ministers from 11 countries and both from health and water and environment. And the number of recommendations have come out of that. We, we really hoped that we can uh, get a recommitment to uh, implementing the global roadmap, but also really focusing on uh, inve uh, adding more investments in, in the wash sector. We've been working to provide a lot of technical support. Um, as you know, countries are stretched with the different emergencies. So supporting countries, deploying uh, technical experts to, to beef up the, the colleagues that are on ground, but also supporting local recruitment because you need a lot of people to be able to man the cholera treatment centers effectively and ensure that the patients that are in there get the all, all, all round uh, monitoring and support that they need to, to, to rapidly correct the dehydration. So provision of supplies, I think over the last uh, uh, two months, we have shipped over uh, 455 metric tons of medical supplies, uh, including IV fluids and other supplies needed to manage cholera to the countries that are affected. And um, um, working with the different uh, partners within the region, we are still trying to address uh, some of the, the pipeline concerns in, in terms of uh, lack of uh, um, adequate stocks of these cholera kits and other supplies we need. The issue of surveillance was mentioned, it's a critical area. And um, we are working to address not only the, the community-based component of the surveillance, which is a big gap in many countries, and we have seen it in, de in delayed detection of outbreaks, but also the issue of cross-border uh, collaboration and information sharing. Um, one of the things that we have really, uh, and we really encourage is the issue of the integrated uh, community-based interventions. 
making sure that you have IPC watch, surveillance, community case management, uh, linking with the oral, the oral rehydration points. And then as, as Philippe mentioned, the engagement with the community, having that package together in the hotspots is really something that has shown to be very, very effective. Um, um, having these uh, integrated teams moving at a community level and addressing those issues uh, jointly. The issue of training of healthcare workers, uh, ensuring that we do not only focus on establishment of CTCs and CTUs, but making sure we have oral rehydration points that link in uh, and ensure people access uh, rehydration early before even they develop severe uh, dehydration, intensifying community engagement, um, supporting the, the, the OCV campaigns in despite the limited doses available globally. Um, I think so far we have been able to implement uh, uh, 3.4 million doses in uh, DRC, Kenya, and uh, Mozambique. South Sudan started last week, and then Mozambique has uh, just gotten approval for an additional 1.3 million doses, which they will be rolling out. So the OCV, as Philip mentioned, is really reactive. And in this context, just um, it is not the, the solution. And the solution is for us to focus on, ad on addressing the wash issues uh, so that we can be able to fully interrupt the transmission. And within our region, we uh, established a number of countries that are at risk based on the historical uh, risk analysis, based on the, the, the number of hotspots that we had previously, but also looking at the population movement and uh, the, how close they are to countries which have uh, uh, intense transmissions at the moment. So we've been working with them to scale up operational readiness. Some of the challenges, Philip mentioned a number of them. I think uh, the competing public health priorities uh, the issue of the cyclone, the impact it is having on, on the transmission in the region, the limited resources, the inadequate staff skills, uh, the lack of medical supplies, the issue of the limited wash, uh, access to latrine, access to safe and clean water is a uh, big challenges. The suboptimal surveillance and uh, data management. Uh, also, I wanted to add the issue of the late detection in some places, I think, the outbreaks have been detected one or two weeks later. Uh, our, in some of the countries, the health-seeking behavior or sometimes self-medication and people presenting in some clinics which, which are not uh, run effectively. So it delays and, and the number of times we detect through com reports of community deaths before you can be able to respond. So it's an area that really countries need to be able to strengthen so that we have early detection and, and, and response. The low risk perception, I think in a number of countries, people um, were not really giving the, 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 the attention to the, to the cholera and they think it is just something uh, that, that will pass. No, we have dealt with it before, but as uh, Dr. Sylvie was mentioning, you know, cholera is a disease that you can be fine this morning and in the afternoon you're extremely dehydrated and you can die if, you, if the fluids are not replaced and urgently. So the, the low risk perception and late presentation at treatment centers has been one of the drivers for, for mortality that we have seen. So in conclusion for us within the, 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 the Afro region, currently we have 13 countries with active transmission. The good news is we have noticed some overall decrease uh, in, in new cases and deaths since week six. It is too early to celebrate given some of the factors that I've, I've given. Um, in, in week 10, which is just the last week, we've seen increases in Burundi, DRC, Mozambique, and Tanzania. And so we need to keep an eye in these countries and make sure that uh, these transmissions are, are really contained with special focus on Mozambique, uh, uh, given the, the impact of, uh, and, and Malawi, given the impact of Cyclone Freddy. Uh, we've seen cases decreasing in Malawi and Kenya. Who really, we hope we can be able to keep that downward trajectory. I mentioned the issue of the Cyclone Freddy in Mozambique and Malawi. It's really, really a big concern to amplify transmission in, in those uh, two countries. Um, the rainy season in the Southern Africa subregion is still projected to go up to the end of April. So we still have uh, a lot of days to go before um, the, the, this uh, problem of, of the cyclones and the rains and the flooding uh, can begin to recede. And so it's really, really important that we scale up response in these countries. The best we can do now is make sure that uh, these outbreaks are contained immediately before they spread further. 
and and um, really stretch the resources that are very meager in these different countries. And uh, my last word would really be um, for countries to to recommit to the uh, the targets that were put in the regional framework for for implementing the global roadmap to end cholera, and and particularly looking at both short term um, investments in in wash, but also the long term investment in access to clean and uh, water and, and hygiene facilities as a way of helping us to eliminate cholera. It has been done somewhere before in other countries. We can also do it in the remaining countries. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Patry. Thank you very much for this uh, deep dive uh, on uh, African situation. And with that, we will well start a Q&A session. And uh, this Q&A session will be moderated also by my colleague, Dr. Terna. Uh, so um, over to you if you want to ask our panelists the first question. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so there are a few questions which we have. I think um, we'll start off um, a question which we have here um, regarding um, the laboratory capacity in Syria. Um, so the question is, um, do we know whether these labs are, um, are working as they were working before or they've been hit with, um, affected by the outbreak? So basically, um, where are we with the diagnostic capacities uh, in Syria at the moment? Um, Philip, you want to? So, I mean, of course, the, uh, the earthquake had had a major impact on, uh, on all the infrastructure. Huh? So it's not just the lab, it's, uh, it's also the access of water and, uh, you know, the, the healthcare facility. But so the, the, I don't have the detail of all the number of labs. I mean, you can imagine uh, <laughs> looking at, uh, you know, 20, 30 different countries uh, at the same time, it's a bit complex. However, the thing is, um, there are some uh, laboratories that are functional, uh, that's clear. Uh, there is a, a sufficient uh, supply in terms of rapid diagnosis tests that are ex uh, extremely useful to do a first screening, okay? So they're not sufficient to do a confirmation, but at least uh, uh, also to, to, to leverage a burden on the laboratory. Uh, of course, it's much more... Um, it's better to do a, a, a culture or to try to do a culture on a test which is already positive on an entity. So, uh, so despite uh, uh, the um, the challenge posed by the earthquake, the uh, the capacity uh, for uh, detecting outbreak is still available uh, in uh, in uh, in the area. Okay, thank you very much, Philip. Uh, maybe I'll come back to you, Patrick. Um, we have a question. Um, I think you may have touched on it, but um, in, in limited resource, resource settings, how do we address the intrinsic factors of cholera outbreaks? I, uh, I'm sure you might also want to respond to that, but how do we, in, and uh, we've clearly seen that quite a couple of the countries affected are, are countries that uh, uh, basically have issues around that. So how do we address these challenges where we have um, limitations in resources? Patrick, you want to make a comment yes, on that I, before we we'll come back to Philip? And, and Philip will, will, will address. I think, and that has been our biggest uh, point of advocacy because um, in, in limited resource settings, uh, we know that the government um, do not have all the resources to be able to provide uh, safe and clean water to everyone. But we cannot fold our hands and not do anything because then the outbreaks will continue to spread and more people will continue to die. So in, in such situations, there's usually uh, two steps. One is the emergency wash intervention. In the short uh, to medium term, how do we make sure that people have access to safe and clean water? And, and usually it's either by uh, tracking in water or providing in tracking in safe water or providing as a uh, household level treatment uh, modalities like the tablets or, or circuits that they can be able to use to treat the water that's available to them at the community level. Then um, the second level has been the issue of now uh, advocating for long-term investment in, in, 
a provision of safe uh, water, uh, protected water sources in communities where they do not have any uh, uh, provision of piped water in where resources are available. And it's, it's an area of development that we cannot ignore for which we need to continuously advocate with, with both development partners and governments to be able to invest in. So in, in most of these settings, IDP and the other areas, conflict affected areas, I think our focus is, is usually on the immediate uh, emergency wash interventions that can help us to be able to stop the transmission and then continue advocacy for investment in long-term solutions to providing safe and clean water and hygiene facilities. Over to you, Philip. So, the, the, of course, I mean, I'm totally in agreement with what you said, Patrick. The thing is, uh, I mean, we have to face a hard reality. Huh? Uh, cholera is not uh, the priority for many, uh, for the global community. Let's let's put it like that. So, uh, so this is something on which uh, uh, you know we we are constantly uh, uh, advocating uh, for more support, uh, also directed to the country. Because you know, as uh, uh, Patrick uh, clearly uh, highlighted it, I mean, we are talking in most of the instances among the, the the poorest country in the world. So of course, uh, so this is something which is important. So there have been a massive uh, 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 support provided to WHO in terms of you know supply. Uh, uh, deployment expertise, uh, uh, drugs, uh, vaccine, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. Uh, and that along, and I really insist on that with uh, uh, other partners hein, like uh, Gavi, UNICEF, uh, the NGO like MSF, the GTFCC. So it's a global thing. But what is very important is to try to uh, to keep that uh, under the public health agenda, despite all the crises that are happening in the world. Cholera is not a facility. Okay, so it can be prevented. So the thing is where sometimes donors, partners are a little bit discouraged about, oh, yes, but wash is too costly, wash is too complicated. This is not the case. The thing is we need to invest in wash now in the, 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 uh, the hotspot area, in the area where we know that the outbreak will start almost every year to prevent them to spread to other things. So it's not a fatality. It's not, uh, you know, uh, uh, it's not, uh, it's something that can be done and tackled. So, and the, 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 the message, which is also important now, we have seen the impact of climate change. You know, the more we wait and the more it will be complex and the more it will be costly. So, um, uh, you know, if if some uh, of the, the resources that are available for other big uh, development plans could be focused on cholera hotspot, we could make a big improvement. But that's not something that we can do alone. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much, Philip. I think maybe I'll just link that up with another comment with which will question that had come around in the priority countries that we had listed. Um, how many of these have developed national control plans that have been budgeted by governments and, and things like that? I think that links up with this issue around uh, um, the kind of support that is being provided through the GTFCC around that too. So, I mean, it's a very, very good question. Uh, I don't have exactly the number because I did not make this calculation, but I could. But uh, uh, most of the country uh, that we are talking about, apart from the new one, uh, you know, country like uh, Lebanon or Syria or, or on our recently South Africa, we are not even, uh, uh, you know, listed as priority country for the GTFCC. So, of course, this one they don't have, but for good reasons. But for most of the other ones, uh, they are uh, actively engaged in a way or another. So uh, a country like Malawi, Mozambique, Zambia, uh, you know, has made significant progress in the past in uh, implementing the roadmap or in developing uh, their, their national plan. Uh, there is big work done, for example, in, um, in, uh, in Mozambique. Uh, Zambia has revised, uh, so they have already two versions of the NCP. Uh, DS is making significant progress. Ethiopia, Kenya, uh, you know, so they are, most of the country we are talking about are countries that were actively engaged before the outbreak came. So I think this is important to underline. It's not that you know country were waiting for things to happen. Uh, so the, the issue is yes, most of the country have a budgeted plan. Whether the plan is financed, the answer is clearly no. The resources are not available. 
there are not sufficient resources. So some can be mobilized at national level, of course, but more would need to be uh, mobilized and invest at global level, from global level. Okay, thank you very much, Philippe. Uh, maybe before I go back to Patrick, I think um, maybe one other comment you might want to, 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 to throw some light on will be the issue around OCV. There seems to be quite a lot of information there. I mean, clearly, do we still have a, 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 a shortage in the global stockpile or has there been a boost recently with all the, the outbreaks that we've been seeing? Okay, so uh, many of you might be aware or not. So if you are not aware, I mean, last year in October, the International Coordination Group, which is the group uh, uh, that are managing the emergency stockpile for yellow fever, cholera, meningitis, and Ebola, uh, had to make uh, the unprecedented decision to temporarily suspend the administration of the second dose of cholera vaccine because of shortage of vaccine. Okay, so that provides, let's say, a short, to make a long story short, a shorter immunity. It's that has proven its efficacy in response to outbreak, but uh, provide less immunity in the long term. So this is, again, an unprecedented, uh, unprecedented decision that had to be made, forced by the fact that there was not enough vaccine. Uh, so this decision last year did provide a little bit more availability of vaccine, but that has been very quickly consumed. We are still exactly in the same situation. So. Uh, Patrick was mentioning, you know, the 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 the, the, um, the vaccination that uh, are ongoing or will be ongoing in uh, in a number of countries. Uh, we have the, the number of requests is still increasing, and in the past uh, uh, weeks and months, we uh, never had enough vaccine to provide uh, them to the request. So the the the, the requests are still very much challenged. Uh, and constrained by the demand. So nothing has changed. Will there be a magic uh, solution, a silver bullet uh, before the end of the year? The answer is clearly no. Okay, so we will have more or less the same amount of vaccine uh, in 2023 as we had in 2022. So in 2022, um, 20, 35 million doses were produced, 35 million doses where you uh, were shipped to country right so uh you know it's there was no stock left okay so into uh, next this year we expect to get uh around 37 million so there are some work being done uh there are uh, the, there is the manufacturer which is uh, remaining is making significant effort with the help of the partner with gavi uh, billion million gates foundation and others to improve their production so the the the, the south korean uh, manufacturer will increase its production whether this will suffice to meet the need that's another story there is a new manufacturer that will uh, plan to come in uh, in the in the ocv market but it will take time it will it it's a manufacturer based in south africa so is there um, a short term solution uh, no um, a, a long term solution possibly the question mark is what are we going to do in between so uh, so covid was produced in a very short time that's a question mark. Why does it take so long and uh, how much can we change it? I mean, you know, I'm sure you understand why it's a little bit less attractive to invest in the cholera vaccine uh, that are uh, only going to be used for the poorest country in the world. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so, Patrick, maybe one final question. Um, you had mentioned uh, sort of some of the challenges or gaps around uh, um, surveillance and data. Uh, uh, um, from the region, you want um, to to highlight very quickly maybe any new interventions around strengthening surveillance and notification of cholera within the region. Thank you very much, Jenna, for that question. Um, surveillance remains one of our uh, priorities within within the region. Currently, we are implementing a flagship, which is called. Uh, which is called TAS, as it focuses on strengthening surveillance um, within the African region. And for us, uh, the biggest strategy that we have been using within the region is uh, um, the IDSR, the Integrated Disease Surveillance and Response. And most of the countries had started adapting the third edition. They have not finished their rollout. So our priority 
has been uh, focusing on helping these countries to be able to, to fully roll out the IDSR and, and really um, not only focus on the indicator-based surveillance, which is the surveillance that happens within the health facilities, but also the event-based surveillance. That includes the community surveillance, that, that includes uh, getting alerts from different sources. And we have been working um, with, the, with the HQ to roll out a tool which is called EIOS, Epidemic Intelligence from Open Sources, that also helps us to pick alerts from social media information uh, about events that are happening within the community that can be quickly triaged and, and support investigation. So the, the focus is on one, uh, training more healthcare workers at the facility level to be able to detect accurately and report. The second one is strengthening the capacities of the districts to be able to analyze their data and identify what's happening. And then the third is really deploying the additional tools that can augment uh, the, the indicator-based surveillance in terms of strengthening our event-based surveillance. We can be able, if there's something that we have missed, because a number of the private facilities in most of the countries are not covered by the routine surveillance system, and some of them do not uh, report. And they, they see a significant proportion of the patients, but the event-based surveillance system should be able to pick out uh, where people um, are talking about, uh, people dying with the diarrhea and all this, and we can be able to pick this from the different sources and support investigation. So surveillance remains a priority, and, and it's one of the, the early detection is one of the axes of the uh, global roadmap that Philip talked about, and we have to continuously work with the countries to strengthen early detection and, and confirmation of, of cholera outbreaks within the region. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, um, um, Patrick. Um, so maybe our very last question, and we'll keep it really short, um, I'll direct it to Philip. And lots of questions have come in around WASH. And uh, so basically just um, the linkage between uh, uh, climate change and cholera. Any quick comments you'd like to make around that, and then we'll wrap okay. up. Is Philip's mic muted? Yep, sorry. So, uh, sorry, I, so I don't think you, restarting again. So the link between cholera and climate change, I think is quite straightforward. Uh, okay, so people will ask, do you have the proof? No, we don't. But cholera is a disease transmitted by water. Okay, so is there too much water? Uh, cyclone uh, floods, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, will uh, by contaminating wells and source breaking uh, uh, supply of water will have an impact. So drought, severe drought, again. So, so this uh, um, and and this with this unpredictability, uh, the destruction of material when you have a succession of cyclone. Of course, it will have an impact. How much? When? Uh, which form it will take, that I don't have a crystal ball, so I cannot answer this question. But whether climate change will have an impact, the answer is very clearly yes. Thank you. I think uh, this is uh, uh, the perfect wrap up uh, for this um, webinar uh, on current cholera outbreak. And uh, well, definitely, Wash, wash, wash is an answer. Um, so, and uh, bigger and stronger advocacy for the cholera problem in the countries. And we all need to work on that. Mm. So uh, with this, I would really like to thank Dr. Uh, Patrick and uh, Dr. Philippe uh, for joining us and my colleague, Dr. Terna, who was moderating uh, the part of questions and answer. I want to thank you all for joining us and um, really hope to see you in the next two weeks, uh, in uh, two weeks actually for the 29th of March on another webinar that is going to be on uh, H5 and uh, avian influ influenza uh, through the WHO Information Network for Epidemics, EpiWIN. Please, uh, you can, all these presentations will be uh, on our website as well as the recording of this webinar. So we are looking forward to seeing you again in two weeks. Thank you very much all. Thank you. Thank you.